Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dino Bandhu Jigat Pate Gopisha Gopika Kanta Harada Kanta Namos Tute Jayatam Surato Pango Mama Mandir Matergati Matsavasha Padam Boja Radha Ramada Ramoharam Gopika Kanta Siman Rasa Rasa Rambi Vamsi Vada Karsan Vinashan Urbago Gopanata Sri Sinaham Divyad Brindaranya Kapad Rumada Sri Madhratna Gada Sri Mashanashtram Sri Sri Radha Shira Gopinda Deva Prasabhabhi He Seva Manushmanami <coughs> Namo Brahmanya Devaya, Go Brahmanya Taya Jajigari Taya Krishnaya Go Minaya Namo Namo Mangalang Bhagavad Vishnu Mangalam Guru Rajaja Mangalam Padini Kaksha Mangalaya Tano Hari Om Narayanaya Vidmihi Vasudevaya Dimihi Tano Vishnu Prachodiya Tehe Om Mahadevi Javidmihi Vishnu Padnichi Dimihi Tano Lakshmi Prachodiya Tehe Mahadakshmi namastibyam namastibyam sare sare hari pare namastibyam namastibyam dhanai tere Tapta kanchana gaurangi rari vindavani share vishavana sute devi pranamani pare pare Narayanam namaskritam naram chevananutamam devam sarasatim vyasam dato jehodire Nashta preshu abadreshu nityam bhagadesa bhagavati utama shaki bhaktir bhavati naishtikim Nikama Kapaturu Gari Dham Panam Shukha Mukaramita Dravi Samadam Pivata Bhagavatam Rasha Mariam Mahora Hori Shikan Krishna Sadam of Agate Damagini Karona Staji Samasha Paranako Duno Ditaham Nama Om Vishnu Paraya Krishna Pastaya Bhutare Shimari Bhakti Bharata Shamita Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pachari Ne Nivishes Sonyuari Paskadate Sap Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadada Sri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Thanks for joining me Rob I feel a little embarrassed in front of Rob because we have a Tuesday night conference call weekly, and I'm usually the host. Everyone um, asks for access through me, and I was in Shopko <laughs> picking up some things for the buffet at the time the meeting was supposed to have started. I apologize to Rob and to the others for that. <clears throat> doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Good morning, Charlie. Good morning, by Bobby. Good morning, Brett. Good morning, Jean. By Bobby's got some peacock emojis there. I have three peacock babies wandering around with their mom so far. I don't know if there are any more forthcoming. Those three have been around for a couple of weeks and they're getting some size on them, which is encouraging when they're really small and tiny. They're so fragile that some of them don't make it. In fact, this mother had five to start with. She's got three. Two didn't make it, but I think these three will because they've got enough enough size on them right now. And with that size, they can fly up at night. They can fly into higher perches, which keeps them a little bit safer from predators. I believe this is our 45th session talking about Dervas and Umbarish. And our title today is Contrasting Them, drawing some contrast between <clears throat> the angry, irascible Nirvasa Muni, who in this instance at least goes out of his way to find fault with the faultless devotee, Maharaj Ambarish, contrasting him with Ambarish, who even though Nirvasa was greatly at fault, and Ambarish not at all, Ambarish <clears throat> still remained in the position of the well-wisher, of Dervasa. He prayed for Dervasa even during the entire year that Dervasa was running away from the Sudasan Chakra. Marjan did not have the attitude, oh, good riddance, he got what he deserved. Marjan did not do what most of us would have done. He did not put Ambarish, he did not put thoughts of Dervasa out of his mind. He constantly thought of Dervasa. He continued his fast. You know, what, what would we have done? <clears throat> I mean, if, if we had, had been so fortunate as to have been standing there blasphemed by Dervasa, Dervasa throws a fire weapon at us, and the fire weapon is con counteracted by the Sudarsana Chakra. And the last thing we see is Dervasa Muni, his backside, 
just high tailing out there with the Sudarshana chakra. How many of us would have just said, good riddance, he's getting what he deserves, put him out of our mind, sit down and break our fast with a good meal, not giving him a second thought, thinking maybe after some time I'll hear about his, his death and, and I won't shed any tears over him. That's pretty much what most of us would have done. Ambarish, not at all, not at all. First of all, he did not take offense at Dervasa's violent rage. And when Dervasa was out of sight, he was not out of mind. Ambarish did not put him out of mind once he went out of sight. Ambarish continued his fast out of concern for the misery and suffering of Dervasa, which he felt he was responsible for. And he, he, his posture was that of just waiting. It was a posture of suspense. He figured sooner or later, Dervasa would come back his way and he would ask Dervasa forgiveness. So he put everything on hold. He was the king of the world. He had obviously many, many responsibilities. He was to have completed his vow, broken his fast, and gotten back to whatever administration or management was incumbent upon him. He put all that on hold, put the whole kingdom, which incidentally consisted of the entirety of the earth, on hold. And he just waited in suspense to see if there would be anything he could do to um, directly relieve Dervasa from his suffering. And indirectly, he continued his fast. Later on, when Dervasa finally did come back, without Dervasa's even asking it, without just assessing the situation, Ambri sees Dervasa coming back after one year, still being chased by the Sudarsana Chakra. And without subjecting Dervasa to the humiliation of asking for help, Ambrish immediately addresses himself to the Sudarshana Chakra. He immediately asks the Sudarshana Chakra, can you back off from this person? And when the Sudarshana Chakra does not do it right away, the second thing that Ambarish is ready to do is to give up the results of all his pious activities. You know, he, he obviously had such pious activities that he could have on the strength of this pie, he, he could have gone to any planet in the in the heavenly planets, any planet of the demigods. Over and above that, he could have gone back to home, back to God. He's willing to sacrifice his own salvation. Hundreds of thousands of years of life in the heavenly planets slash eternal liberation in the spiritual world. He addresses the Sudashana, Yadahi Bhagavan Prita, Eka sarva ganasriyam, sarva bhutana bhutanam, dvijatpam jachacharam. He says to the Siddhasana, I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to spend. I'm willing to give you all the currency of all my pious activities. If you'll save this Brahman from your wrath. Still the Siddhasana chakra doesn't back up. Still he's looming and threatening and singeing. Dravasa Muni. So finally, Maharaj Ambarish, he says to the Sudarshana Chaka, you know, our God is a God of forgiveness. Our God is a God of forgiveness. So it will please, it would please Krishna if on my request, you cease and desist. And as soon as Sudarshana Chaka heard the name of his Lord and Master, Lord Vishnu, Lord Krishna, and concluded along with Ambarish that yes, indeed, it would be pleasing to Lord Krishna if Sudarshana would release this Brahman upon the request of his pure devotee. Wasn't Sudarshana wasn't thinking it would be pleasing to release him, but Sudarshana said it would be pleasing to release him now that his pure devotee and that person whom Dervasa offended has now requested. And at that point, Sudarshana stopped. Dervasa got relief from his suffering without having even had 
to ask for it. Such was the grace, compassion, and mercy of the pure devotee. We're talking about contrasting Dravasa and Ambarish. One story can't but help spring to mind. It's a story about Alexander and a sage. Alexander <clears throat> wanted to take a wise man from India back to Macedonia with him. And so he had one man in mind, particularly. He came to the sage. And he asked the sage, he said, would you accompany me back to Europe? And he said, I'll give you, I'll make you my prime minister. I'll give you your own palace. I'll give you wealth, women, whatever you want. And the sage said, no, thank you. I'm fine here. I've got everything I need. I've got fruits from the tree. The tree shades me from heat and from, from rain. I've got my students. I teach them higher principles of morality, and they give me some donations, some little rice and food. I've got everything I need right here. And Alexander says, do you realize what I'm offering you? I'm offering you a prime ministership of an entire world empire. How can you be so foolish that you would pass this up and i don't see that you have a lot of resources here you're just sitting under a tree wearing a loincloth i don't see any kitchen or food pantry or i don't see people lining up to support you i've got the whole world at my command and this is a similarity between alexander and Ambarish. Ambarish, of course had everyone's goodwill he hadn't become king of the world through intimidation and fear like Alexander had. And Ambarish's options were eternal because they were given to him by the Supreme Personality of God and nobody could divest him of those opulences, whereas Alexander was soon to die. In any case, the story goes on that Alexander started to get a little peeved. And he said, well, let's, Alexander said, let's put it this way. If you don't come back with me, forget about the opulence and all. I mean, I, I will give you all that. But if if that's if that's not enough to motivate you to come with me, um, well, I I'll just draw my sword, and if and if and if you don't come, I'll kill you. The sage looked Alexander in the eye. He said, "You say you say that you're king of the world, but I say that you're a servant of my servant." At that point, Alexander really lost it, just like your Vasa, really lost it. And he, he drew his sword, he cocked his arm. You better explain yourself real quick, otherwise you're a dead man. The sage went on to say that I, I have conquered anger as a result of my devotion and my penances, my discipline. I've conquered anger. Anger does never has controlled me in recent history. On the other hand, when there have been provo provoking circumstances such as the current one at present, I have never given way to anger. I have controlled anger. Anger has tried to control me, but the opposite ended up. I controlled anger. And we, we find again, Dervas is controlled by anger, but Ambarish controls anger. So, Ambarish, so Alexander said, anger is my servant and you are his servant. Anger is my servant, and you are the servant of my servant. To Alexander's credit, when he heard that, he thought about it for a second. He said, yeah, I guess you're right. And he sheathed his sword, went back to Europe, and died on, died on the way, en route. <laughs> When Dervasa lost it, his, his anger was unleashed. It took the form of a fiery demon who carried a trishula, a trident, trident in his hand. His name was Kritya. He came rushing towards Ambarish Maharaj. <clears throat> it said that he was so formidable that he made the surface of the earth tremble by his footsteps. He was blazing like a second sun. Now, in the face of this 
monster coming his way. It is said that Maharaj Ambarish was not in the least, least bit disturbed and did not move even slightly from his position. Later on, we're going to see how when the Sudarshan came after Durvasamuni, he had the exact opposite reaction from Maharaj Ambarish. Maharaj Ambarish was not disturbed at this fiery demon and did not move even a finger to avoid him. But when the, when the shoe was on the other foot, when the tide was turned, Durvasamuni took off lickety split. He couldn't get out of there fast enough. Again, another contrast between the reactions of the non-devotee Durvasamuni and the devotee Marjambarish. Come, brings to mind another devotee named Chitraketu who um, took his birth as a demon due to, to unfairly being cursed by Parvati, the wife of Lord Shiva. In his next life, Chitraketu took birth as Brikasura as in a de demoniac family. Brikasura um, wanted to give up his demonic body so he could go back to him better association and resume his devotional service to the Lord. And when he was faced with death, not only did he not protest, he had that in common with Maharaj Ambarish. He didn't lift a finger to avoid death. Death came to him in the form of Indra wielding a thunderbolt, which was empowered with the Shakti of Lord Vishnu. And Indra himself was also made invulnerable with a armor, armor that was impenetrable. And I believe also some of the power of that thunderbolt was gleaned from the bones of a sage named Dadichi. So here comes death in the form of Indra, wielding the thunderbolt, which is empowered by Vishnu, and the extra shakti of the sage Dadichi. The, the problem was Indra wasn't confident. Even with all these assets, he wasn't confident. He saw a huge form of Brikasura, much bigger than him, his head touching the clouds. And Indra lost his nerve. At that point, <clears throat> Brikasura could have just let, let, let it be. You know, live live to fight another day, or he could have killed Indra. Indra, without realizing that Indra had superior firepower, he could have been killed by Brikasura right there. The interesting thing is that Brikasura convinced Indra to kill him. <laughs> Nanveshe Vajra. Vajra means you have a thunderbolt. Shatejisha. Tejisha means power. The power of that thunder. Nanveshe Vajra Tavashrikasha. Hareo Didiche. It is empowered by Hare, Krishna, and the austerity of Didiche. Nanveshe Vajra Tavashrika Hare Didiche Tavasha. Teneva Shatrum Jahi Vishnu. Yato Hariya Shir Vinashkana. Considering all these things, you cannot fail. All you have to do is just release the thunderbolt in my direction. And he's like, come on, you can do this. You can do this. Don't be afraid. My bark is worth and my, my bark is worse than my bite. I, I want to give up my body. All the circumstances are conspiring to favor you. You'll be famous throughout thousands of years for killing me, the scourge of the universe. Come on, come on, come on. So consider all the all the various levels of devotees. Here's Ajamil who cried out for help at the time of death, having committed lots and lots of bad choices throughout his life. There's Gajendra, the elephant, intoxicated, or amongst many other she elephants who whose leg was seized by a crocodile. Gajendra asked, asked the Lord for help. Then you come to such examples as Prahlad Maharaj, who tolerated all kinds of tortures from his own demoniac father, never asked the Lord for any help, 
just continued chanting Hare Krishna, figuring that whatever happened was the Lord's mercy. And very similar to Prahlad Maharaj, you have Ambarish. He stood there and said, essentially, he did not lift a finger. The, the demon himself was his footsteps. The demon that Dervasa had conjured, his footsteps were causing the earth to tremble. And in spite of the unstable situation, the earth, it is said that Marge Ambrish did not blink. He did not even lift a finger. Another story, another tangential story here. I was giving a tour the other day. Some visitors came to the temple, and I told a story that I haven't told for quite some time. I don't know why, but it just popped into mind. I think it was because of a lot of teenage boys. I thought teenage boys would like this story that Rajasthan is the uh, the, the people of Rajasthan, our temple is a Rajasthani style architecture. And uh, Stan means place and Raja means king. So Rajasthan is the Spartan, Sparta of India. Great military tradition, great tradition of chivalry. So much so that um, in previous times, a 12, 13 year old Rajasthani prince would have to prove that he's he would be worthy to be a king in the future. And the way that he had to prove that was to kill a tiger single-handedly. Certainly a daunting task, isn't it? <laughs> 13, 14 year old boy. Of course, he's had military training his whole life from the age of five, but still a tiger is 500 pounds. He's got switch blades on the end of each of his fingers. He's got steak knives for teeth. He's all muscle. He can move quicker than the eye can follow. How does a 13-year-old boy single-handedly kill a tiger in order to prove that in the future he has what it takes to be the king? Uh, the answer is given if you ever go to Jaipur, the pink city, capital of Rajasthan. There's a temple of Krishna in the center of the city, and adjacent to the temple is an art gallery and a museum and a weapons museum all the different weapons that the Rajasthan has used throughout the years. And the particular weapon that this young boy would use to kill a tiger is on display there. It's kind of a spike with a guard for the wrists, kind of a hand guard, a plate that goes this way and a spike. That's it, I mean, to kill a tiger. And then there's a little shield, maybe two and a half feet in diameter. That was, that, that was it, those are the only implements. So, so how did this boy, not not get eaten, of course. And the answer is it had to do with looking the tiger in the eye. You find the tiger, you square off to the tiger. The tiger will not charge as long as you can look him in the eye. Of course, it takes a lot of nerve to look a tiger in the eye. As soon as you blink, tiger will take that as a sign of weakness and fear, and he'll be on you like a freight train. So you cannot even blink. You cannot even glance away for a moment you have to hold the eyes that you can imagine the eyes of the tiger he's hungry he's bloodthirsty he's vicious he's merciless he's without scruples he's without any conscience he sees you only as a gourmet meal uh, filet mignon he can't wait to he can't wait to sink his teeth into your warm flesh and drink your blood but he will not he will not charge you as long as you look steadily in his eye. And that's what this young Rajasthani prince needs to do without glancing aside, without a single blink. He has to look that tiger in the eye. And while he's doing that, he has to lower his, sense, his center of gravity, put one knee on the ground, get as low as he can, raise that shield, and then have that uh, dagger ready to go. And then when he's completely ready to receive the charge of the tiger, then and only then does he blink. Sure enough, the tiger's shot towards him like out of a cannon. And then what he needs to do is use the momentum of that tiger, the rush of the tiger's momentum, to get that tiger up enough. It only takes maybe six or eight inches of leverage. And... So he needs to break, take that force, 500 pounds hurtling towards him at like 30 miles an hour. And he needs to leverage that force up enough that he can get underneath and into the heart of the tiger. 
then he's going to be king. Otherwise, he's not going to be king. <laughs> so such a nerve. This is the this is the nerve of the warriors to remain cool when all about you are losing. I think Rudyard Kipling wrote a song, something about that, what it takes to be a man, my son. Maharaj Ambarish, this demon was coming to him. The ground was shaking. He was roaring enough to break your eardrums. Maharaj Ambarish did not blink. His heartbeat was probably a nice 65. His blood pressure, 125 over 65 and it wasn't just because he was a trained warrior but it was because he was a devotee Brikasura said uh, Indra, Indra, Indra is kind of wondering like how can, how can you yeah, I can understand if there's a threat and, you, and you're a devotee and like Gajendra or like Ajamil you ask Krishna for help that's natural you know the, the young child runs to the father to be rescued that's natural i could understand that if you you know if you called out to vishnu at this point in time yeah i could understand why you would do that um indra said i i can, i've also heard that uh, you know like prahlad maharaj and ambarish maharaj did not call out to vishnu they were on a a, a higher level of, of surrender and, it, and they had deeper insights. They realized that no matter what happens, I'm always in the hands of the Lord. The Lord works for my good and not for my harm. Even if something seems to be for my harm, he'll know how to turn it around my good. So in the case of Prahlad, as well as the case of Umbrish, they didn't ask the Lord for help at all. They didn't ask the Lord for help at all. And Nunder says, yeah, I can sort of understand that imperturbability in the face of death, because as a devotee, you trust and have faith in the Lord that uh, he's going to, uh, you know, if, if, if he takes away your current body, he's going to give you a better position somewhere else. Um, but then Indra's like, but, but this, but Brigasura, you're, you're coaching me how to kill you. This is a different, this is like, wow, you're a demon. You're a demon. And you're coaching me how to kill you. You're like uh, cheering me on. And at that point, Prikasura said, Narayana Parasarve Nakutashi Sharga Baba Abhituliyatu. He said, devotees just want to serve Narayan. When uh, Parvati cursed me to give up my Brahman's body, so my Chatriya's body, and become a demon, I wasn't upset by it because I'm not attached to externals. I'm not this body. I'm a spirit soul. If it was the Lord's desire that I take birth as a demon and serve him in that way, I was fine with that. I didn't gnash my teeth and beat my breasts and say, woe is me, this is unfair. I was only too happy to take birth as a demon and uh, follow the instructions of the Lord in that particular birth. And now that my sojourn on earth as a demon and demonic body is coming to an end, I want to hasten my resumption of devotional service amongst the devotees. But the, but the guiding factor is I want to serve the Lord. If the Lord wants me to die and take birth as a demon. I'm not afraid of death. Death for the devotees is a portal. It's the next assignment. It's the next step. Hopefully you've discharged your duties in this life satisfactorily so the Lord will give you more responsibility in the next life. We want to cross that, break the tape, finish the race of our life, cross the finish line, and we want to hear from the sky, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done, my good and faithful servant. It's all we live for is the smile. Pritayitam kalapare parina mandam jasha mohayami bhajmaya. After going through all the trials and tribulations, her young sons were persecuted. 
there were many attempts to kill her adolescent sons by those in power there in Hastinavur, Dhritarashtra, and Duryodhan and others. Uh, their house was burned down. Their wife was kidnapped. They um, had to fight a great war. They had to live in exile for many, many years. And when it was all over, when their enemies were killed and they were restored to their kingdom, they were living safely in the palace surrounded by bodyguards and retainers. She, she said that it was all worth it because at the end of all those tribulations, Krishna smiled. And it said he smiled mildly. It was more like the hint of a smile. And yet that smile that Krishna bestowed upon Kunti for her forbearance in the midst of all those troubles, it was, it was the ultimate. It was the ultimate. Kunti went through everything that she went through in order to get a smile from Krishna. And she said, if I could get another smile, I would gladly go through it all again. There's nothing higher than to get the approval of the Lord. Unfortunately, we waste most of our lives trying for the approval of our parents and our teachers and our coaches, our politicians. And all we really need is the approval of Krishna. When you've got Krishna's approval, when Krishna's for you, it is said, who dare be against you? Rigasura said to Indra Narayana Prasarave, the highest goal for a devotee is to shelter at the lotus feet of Narayana. Whether that, whether, whether that shelter come in heaven or in hell, it doesn't matter. If, I, if a devotee were in heaven, but there were no service to do, the devotee would consider that to be hell. If they were in in hell and there was service to do, a devotee would consider that to be heaven, as long as there's service. That's all that the devotee wants. And because of their equanimity and their poise and their equal vision towards everything, everyone, they have no enemy, but oftentimes people become their enemies, even to the point of torturing them. Ambarish had no fault whatsoever. He, he, in his mind, in his heart, he had only respect and love for Dravasa Muni. And yet Dravasa Muni was so envious of his cool and calm that he tried to kill him. And as, as we know, Ambarish's response was to be fully dependent upon the mercy of the Lord. Here's one of the reasons why Maharaj Ambarish was imperturbed it's example given in the 48th verse of the fourth chapter of the ninth canto of the shuman bhagavatam it it says that in in the fire um the forest fire the big forest fire as it as it goes through the the dry bark and trees and leaves that are on the ground it will burn to ashes any angry snake. Normally, the snake is quite dangerous. I heard about puff adders, for instance, in Africa. They, if you get bitten by a puff adder, you horrible things happen to your body, and you die within two minutes. The, the venom is so lethal. Um, what is that? The fair de lance in Latin America is also can kill you within a minute or so due to its poison. But no matter how dangerous, no matter how lethal a poisonous serpent may be, there's only one thing he can do in the face of a forest fire. And that is to slither away as fast as he can. So however intimidating that demon was, that creature demon, big and loud and causing the earth to, to tremble with his footsteps and wielding a, a trident running towards Maharaj Ambarish. As soon as Krishna intervened, as he promised, by invoking the Sudarsana Chakra, then that demon was compared to a serpent in a forest fire. Whatever power he had to kill was certainly trumped 
was certainly um, uh, eclipsed by the power of the Sudha Sun Chakra. And his power, just like that serpent, is immediately burned to ashes in the forest fire. Similarly, Krita, he was immediately burned to ashes in the forest fire. And Mahajambrit, depending on the promise of the Lord to protect his devotee in all circumstances, neither did he move an inch from where he was, neither did he blink, neither did he request the Supreme Personality of God to give him protection. He was fixed in the understanding. He was thinking of the Supreme Personality of God in the core of his heart, and he was not in the least bit fearful of death. His body was external, his position was external, his influence was external, his kingdom was external. He knew this truth. For the soul, there is neither birth nor death, nor having been, does he ever cease to be. He is unborn, eternal, primeval. The soul is not slain when the body is slain. The inner soul continues when the outer body ends, like flame from wood sparks ascending, transcending dark matter, blending with the sky, invisible to the naked eye. You cannot kill nor can you die. You cannot burn nor can you fry. The soul cannot be scorched by any blaze. No water can drown the spirit. No wind can make it fade. You cannot cut another nor can you bleed. The soul is eternal, unborn a seed indivisible, indestructible, forever free from birth, death, old age, and disease. Yet howsoever turned or tossed, the soul can never itself exhaust. Seated in the heart, beating its drum, powering everyone brighter than the sun, the soul's superior force lives on and runs its endless course in God's unlimited universe. Devotee doesn't fear death. The story comes to mind of Narada Muni. He met four kinds of people. First, he met a brahmachari an impersonalist, a single celibate monk. The monk asked for a blessing. Narada Muni said, said, uh, what did he say? <laughs> he said, you could die immediately. He said, you could die immediately because you've accumulated so much pious activities, you're going to enjoy the, the release from embodiment. You're going to, you're going to taste some of the bliss. You're going to taste some of the nectar of realizing that you're Brahman, you're eternal. And so you've done penances and austerities just in order to merge into the Brahman. So go ahead and die and achieve your goal. Then he came to a king. King asked Narada Muni for a blessing. He said, long live the king. May you live a long time because you're, you have multiple wives, you're gambling, you're taking some intoxicants. So um, uh, after you die, you, all those things are going to be taken away. You'll no longer have those enjoyments at your disposal. So may you live a long time because in your next life, you could very well be a dog. Next person that Narada Muni uh, came to was a butcher. Butcher asked Narada Muni for a blessing. Narada Muni said, don't live, don't die. He said, I can't wish that you live because you're committing sinful activities every day by killing animals, notably cows. And I can't bless you that you die because as soon as you die for every hair on the back of every cow that you've killed, you'll take birth as a cow yourself and go to the slaughterhouse. So he told the, the, the ascetic, he said, you can die immediately. He said to the king, don't, don't die any time, live long. He said to the butcher, don't live, don't die. I don't, I, don't know what to, I don't know what to tell you. He came to a devotee, someone who's worshiping Lord Krishna, just like Maharaj Imbrish did, talking about Krishna's glories, using his hands to clean the temple, his feet to go back and forth in the temple, his mind to think about Krishna. And he said, he said um, it doesn't really matter. He said, does it, it does, there, isn't a, there isn't any way I can bless you because you're already engaged in devotional service. And after you leave this current body, you'll continue to engage in devotional service. The devotional service is a summum bonum. It's the perfection of life. You're already engaged in it. And, the, and so there's no, there's no way I can take you higher. 
So he said to the devotee, either live or die, it doesn't matter because in your next life, you'll still be serving me. You'll still be serving the, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And that's why death holds no fear for a devotee. What he's doing right now, he's going to continue to do that in the next life. On the other hand, those who are non-devotees who don't have Krishna apparent and visible within the core of their hearts, who have worked for temporary material advantages, have everything to lose and everything to fear at the time of death. That's why they can't even admit their imminent death to themselves. They deny it. They put it out of their mind. And because they are in the habit of putting it out of their mind, they're so shocked when it happens, when death comes, they, they can't believe it. They haven't thought about it. They haven't made any preparations. They haven't dealt with it. They haven't resolved any of the issues surrounding death. And so along with the, the actual pain of death is the trauma, the shock, the surprise <laughs> that that which they had <laughs> conscientiously avoided thinking about their entire life raises his ugly head and taps him on the shoulder. The, the final and most startling contrast between Ambarish and Dervasi is that in the face of his imminent death, Ambarish did not blink. He did not raise a finger. He did not react in any way whatsoever. And in contrast to him, when the, when Dervasa's life was in immediate danger. He just took off running, lickety split, no question. Just high-tailed it right out of there with, with his tail between the legs. And that's the difference. The devotee sees death as a portal through which he'll continue his devotional service. The non-devotee doesn't really know what's on the other side. They've lived in total denial and ignorance of death and its ramifications and consequences so for them it's shocking it's fearful um uh it, it is the ultimate nightmare for someone who's lived their life with materialistic goals and ambitions the fact is that the constitutional position for the living entity is to be engaged in the service of the lord each and every one of us was created by the lord as an eternal living being and there is nothing within this material world, Ramanda, Brahmite, Konu, Bhagavan, Jiva, Guru, Krishna, Pashari, Pai, Bhakti, Lota, Bish. There is nothing valuable for the living entities within this material world, save and accept to get the Kripa, the Bhagavan Kripa, the mercy of the Lord in terms, and, and the mercy of the Lord comes to us in the form of the spiritual master. It says that after who knows how many incarnations, how many different bodies traveling to how many different planets from the upper to the lower planets throughout how many different tens of hundreds of perhaps even millions of years one finally comes to the position of inquiring what is the real ultimate purpose of this human form of life and when one comes to that level of consciousness and one seeks out answers to those questions seeks out one's divine creator then the Lord approaches that serious and sincere inquirer in the form of a bona fide spiritual master. Tad bini prani 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 In the Bhagavad Gita, the formula, the prescription for solving all the problems of material life is given by Lord Krishna Arjuna. Just try to learn the truth by approaching a spiritual master. Inquire from him submissively and render service unto him. The self-realized soul can impart knowledge unto you because he has seen the truth. <laughs> Om Tat Sat. <clears throat> Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Well, thank you for joining us, Gene, as always. Thank you, Brent Pranams. Got you scheduled to give some classes, I think, uh, maybe three weeks from now. Check out, uh, I'll share the lecture schedule. I'd like you to give a class in Salt Lake on Saturday night, and then you give the next same class the next day in um, Spanish Fork, if you don't mind. I figure after three weeks in India at Govardhan Equa Village, you're, you're 
ready to give some class, ready to share some nectar. Good morning, Shali. Good morning, my Bobby. Govinda Dave. Sue, she's tuning in from Virginia and points north. Gina, Sita Ram. Gina, nice to hear from you. Gina's my friend from Southern California. Gina, Coquila, KK, all the good people down there. Rob, are you there? Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Hare Bo. Can you give us some droplets of nectar as a postscript to our discussion today? I'll give you what I got. It is our fault if we take insult. A devotee is mercy and grace. Animosity has no place. Mm. Keep Krishna near and know no fear. Nice. Keep calm and bhakti on. <laughs> go, go the extra mile for Krishna's smile. There you go. Don't get caught in the fire of Krishna's ire. Go get pot, caught in the fire of what desire? Don't get caught in the fire of Krishna's ire. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Thank you for those. Please do send them to me. I will include them in our Facebook post. And um, yeah, that's it for this week. Um, 45 sessions, I believe, and counting on the wonderful example of Maharaj. Maharaj. And I think one of the reasons we don't want to leave him is just because he makes us feel so good. He's such a perfect example of what it means to be a devotee. As long as as long as we're talking about him, as long as we're extending and stretching out these series of discussions, some or other, I feel there's hope. Some or other, I feel there's hope. Some or other, at some point, we have the hope of getting Marge Ambarisha's mercy, which is the only way that we ourselves can get purified and go back home, back to God. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hari Ram, Hari Ram, Ram Ram, Hari Hari.